Okay, so this is corn. And I know corn, we're all using corn and in one form or another, but this is, this is, we've been working for four years on, in the Midwest, on the largest corn disease that we have in the U.S. It affects 70 of the 90 million acres that we grow, and it's, it's spreading, it's not reducing. And the basis of this is really, again, genetically modified plants that use a lot of Roundup. They use a Roundup as a burn down, they use a Roundup as a herbicide, and so it's constantly being pumped into the ground, and we have this proliferation of pathogens. And one of these guys is responsible for this in corn. So let's look at this. Goss's wilt organism, it's everywhere. It's called Clavibacter michiganensis nebraskaensis. And this is, this is not this mighty mouse of a disease. It's kind of a wimpy little critter. But when it has nobody keeping it back, it just takes off and goes. And it's on all the seed now, conventional GMO and organic. It's in all the soils. It's airborne, dust and wind. It's also in our water. Okay, this is September 18th. Now corn, it used to be you, you plant it in May and you harvested it in October. And <clears throat> it's supposed to stay green until you harvest. You're supposed to have a live, healthy, functional plant that's green with a dry yellow ear on it because the plant has to stay alive to pull the moisture back out of the ear, okay? This is one of our fields, September 18th. We, this is one of the fields that we put BioImprove on. And the guy that I work with in agriculture, Salam, Ed's met him numerous times. He makes a microbial product. He uses a bunch of microbes that produce the bacteria and that kills the Clavibacter organism. He's the only guy in the US that has a product that's effective against Goss's wilt. And, and it's a cool product because it's not a toxin, it's not a chemical, it's not synthetic. It's made from a microbe. It's on the same concept of how we control E. coli or salmonella. We use a microbe to produce a naturally occurring antibiotic that takes out this pathogen. That's the right way to do it because then you don't have resistance, okay? This is the field right next door, okay? Same time, completely dead. Now, when you look at corn, you start developing this year in August, feeling it, getting the nutrition into it. And so we learned a lot from, from going through this corn and, and looking at it and studying it and testing its mineral content. Here's another field. Can you guess which side has Goss's wilt and which side doesn't? The left side. Left side was treated with bioimproved. The right side has none. This is what an ear of corn should look like. You should have, you should be filled right to the tip. This is off of our bioimprove field. This one is off of our untreated field. And what the clavibacter does is it gets, it comes in through the plant through a wound. So if I get wind, I get an insect bite, I get hail damage, the clavibacter goes into the plant and it slowly begins to strangle the plant. And right here at the nodes, what you see is this browning. Okay. Okay, what you see in these nodes is the clavibacter gets in there and it produces an enzyme that dissolves the cellulose structure in the stock. So it's like an artery. I just plug the artery and dissolve it. So I don't get any blood going up and I don't get any blood going down. And that's what's carrying all my nutrition. My top of my plant's photosynthesizing from the sun producing stuff and the bottom of my plants taking stuff up through the soil. And if I can't exchange this stuff, then 
I just slowly plug and plug and restrict the nutrient transfer up and down the plant. So my plant dies prematurely. So that means all the fertilizer I bought, or a great deal of it, is still in the plant body. It hasn't had time to get moved into the kernel. So let's see what happens to this corn. Okay, so we took this untreated ear and we said, let's take a row of kernels here, 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 and here, and let's look at what the content is. What happened on this stuff that died early, dying in August and early September versus late September, early October? And then here's our bioimprove ear. Again, we just took the rows, A, B, C, D, E, F, all the way down, and this was the basis for our test. Okay? So right now, the non treated versus the treated. Okay? Well, Ears of corn are just like baby pigs. They're bigger at the source of food and they're smaller at the tip. Okay, that's the tail end of the food chain. They don't get it. These are two or three times the size down to the tip. So we're getting the nutrient transfer. Now you put them under a light. What does that tell you? Untreated corn right here, and your bioimproved corn. This translucent kind of iridescent th light that comes through these, this is a level, an indicator of your protein or your zen content. So you can take your corn that you get, put a light underneath it, and if it looks like this, you're kind of on the really low scale on the nutrient side. Okay. Because what happens in the corn is you put in the starches and the sugars first and they kind of fill up and they start puffing and you start to get your kernel size, but it's all sugars. It's all carbohydrates. Your mineral comes in last, not first. Okay? So we took this and we started we, we ran the scans on it. And so what we have is row A, row A, row D, row D. So we took some at the base, some down towards the tip. We said, okay what mineral content ended up in these kernels having value. So this is our bioimprove <clears throat> ear. Silica, 160, silica almost 190. Well, you would say, gee, this is better. Actually, it's not because the plant uses silica as an armor. And so when a plant gets diseased, it will pull more silica up to try to arm itself against the invasion of more pathogens. That's why we see elevated silica right here. Look at my phosphate content, 1700 in my corn that lived and functioned until maturity versus my corn that died weeks earlier. Okay, so, well, what's phosphate good for? Well, it happens to be the base of your energy molecules. Your ATP, ADP, adenosine, triphosphate, adenosine, diphosphate, it's where everything gets its energy, is in the transfer of these minerals. Phosphate is the base of that. Okay, so I've got 1,700 versus 377. I look at my potassium content, almost 2,900 versus 1,850. My calcium content, we're a little higher here than here. Let's go down the cob and see what's happening as we migrate down. Again, our silica is lower because our plant isn't taking it up and using it as armor against the pathogen. On the sick side, the plant that was infected and died earlier, again, you see higher silica content. Here, as we migrate down towards the tip, we have 1,329 on our phosphate. We have 300 here. Our potassium, we have almost 4,000. We have about 2,000 here. 
Our sulfur is at 1200, almost 1300, almost 800 here. Our calcium is at 15, 115 versus 101. And so the diseases are affecting all of these plants in a huge way. And what it does is when you get a wheat disease or a barley disease or a corn disease, it affects the plant's ability to accumulate and transfer nutrition ultimately into the grain. And so we all think, oh, grain is grain is grain. It's not. If you're feeding this corn, which do you think is going to produce healthier chickens, better eggs? Simply because look at the base of minerals we've got to look at and work with because minerals aren't the first thing that migrate into your, your ear of corn. They're one of the last things that migrate in. And if my plant is growing, gets sick in that process, that translocation doesn't happen. And when it dies three, four, five, six weeks early, all I'd done was fill that kernel up with starch. And that is not the basis of nutrition. And so this is what we learned just from this scanner that we have on what's happening to plants. And to look at very critically what gets into the seed. And because that in your poultry operations is your mechanism for growth and performance. And if those minerals aren't there, stuff is shutting down and it ain't happening. Right, Ed? It, it, it all kind of works the same way. You can take a wheat seed and you can, you can look at it and some of them kind of opaque and you can see into them and they're clear and they're hard and some of them are dull. I mean, it's the same thing we're seeing here. This stuff just isn't put together right. It's not finished. Okay, and disease does that. I, I just wish that, like Ed was talking about earlier up in Saskatchewan, I know so many growers that, and we have farmers up there, but when you have one of the ministers of agriculture calling you, saying, get this stuff registered, get this up here, we need this so bad, it's out of the box at that point. It's really a problem. And, but they have, They've, they, they have trouble with their pulse crops, their chickpeas, their lentils, their, their grains. They're overrun with pathogens because of the amount of glyphosate that they've used over and over and over and you've got to have nutrition and you've got to have some barriers to get these plants through so that those vomitoxins don't don't occur because if that fusarium is there and that grain isn't nutritionally dense they'll metabolize and produce all these toxins and then when somebody gets that, it just goes into the bird and the organism takes off again. Toxin is effective. <laughs>